going to zip through it as fast as I can. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. I want to talk about our salvation and how it should be treated this morning. Uh, when I read uh, uh, verse 12, it, it stopped me dead in my tracks. It got my attention. I'd read it many times, but it didn't hardly touch me like it did this time. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as, as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, when I read this, I thought to myself, now, wait a minute, Apostle Paul. We don't have to work out our salvation. It is, it is a free gift from God. It is handed to us. Uh, we don't have to earn it. It is free to us. And it is the best gift that we will ever receive. Amen? Yeah. There is no gift that can top this gift. When, when God's grace and, and, and our belief met in the middle, we had our salvation handed to us at that time. And, and at that time, our, uh, our uh, eternal life was granted to us. There is no better gift. But what Apostle Paul here is saying, work out your own salvation, he's meaning live it out. You have to live it daily. You have to take it with you. It's like a shirt that you wear on your back. You don't lay it down. You don't leave it behind. That's what Paul's saying here to us. And he's also saying with fear and trembling, that means that you uh, deeply respect it and walk in obedience daily with it. But you know, as Christians, a lot of times, man, we get comfortable with this wonderful gift that we have. And, and we, we, we have a tendency to lay it down. You know, we get comfortable with it and we walk off and we leave it a lot of times. But now we may go back to it. We may not leave it for long, but we get comfortable with leaving it. A lot of times, you know, when we go to work, man, we pack our lunch, we get everything ready to go to work, and we make certain our cell phone's with us. Man, we walk out the door with what the things we need that day, and we've left our salvation behind. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. We've left it behind. Yeah. You know, this is summertime. We go on vacation a lot of times. Man, we're excited about it. We go on vacation. We, we go to the beach. A lot of us, and man, we pack our suitcase full of the things we need. We've got shorts, swimming trunks, T-shirts, sunscreen, everything we need. And man, we're excited about it. We take that suitcase, we throw it in the car, man, we get in the car, and we head down the road. We've left our salvation behind all week to fend for itself. You know? We, we do that. We do that. And when we get home, it's all dried up. It's just like a house plant. Who, who's left a house plant all week unattended? When you, get, when you get back home, man, that thing's all dried up. The leaves is all green. Fell off in the container that's holding it. Yep. Your salvation's no different. You have to love on that thing. You've got to water it down. You've got to take care of it. Your salvation's no different. There's two major composites that makes up your salvation. Justification and sanctification when you live out your salvation and you carry it with you daily you become justified that means you you live guilt free you know no better feeling than have peace every day amen peace and sanctification if you're walking in sanctification you become more like Jesus and less like yourself amen that's all I have this morning Brother Earl, I'm going to hand it to you. I might have already preached on this. I know I have preached on it, but well, this was one Wednesday. We're we'll being Romans 14, 21. When you get your place, say amen. Is my time already going? Oh, okay. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby the brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Now, we're going to talk about eating flesh. What does eating flesh mean? That means eating the sin that's in your life, feasting on the sin that's in your life. The sin that's in your life can put you down. Eating flesh, it would be nasty. It's nasty. 
I wouldn't want to eat my skin off of my body. But do not feast on the sin. Fence. And I'm in shambles. For when we were in flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Uh, like I'm in shambles. That's the most, most nervous I've ever been. But if you live after flesh, you shall surely die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Amen. Don't feast on the flesh that's in your body. Uh, take the book a lot, book of bread, and eat on it, and you should surely live. Yeah. 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 How much time do I got? <laughs> two minutes. I've only been preaching for two. <laughs> uh, I couldn't tell you what else to really. Would you turn to Matthew 18, uh, verses 11 through 14? And it says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which is lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety-nine, and go with him to the mountains to seek that which is gone astray? And if so, be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiced more that one sheep than the ninety-nine which had, hath not gone astray. Even so, it is not the will, will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little, sh little ones should perish. So as a child of God, I, and this is how I picture it in this text, we are his sheep, and we are, he, he is ours and we are his. Yeah. So... I picture this, there's, in our lives, we, we, we all like to go in the world, we like to, you know, get a taste of the world, and it says that he gone astray, and he went to the mountains, this little sheep did, and I, and I see the mountains as the world, and we all know that there is nothing in the world that can satisfy your heart, and, but we still, we still love to just, you know, go get a taste of the world, even though it's wicked, there's nothing you can really receive in it, and, you know, we see that, aren't you glad that the Father, he doesn't just leave us in the world, you know, and we're saved, and we, we understand that, that whenever we're in the world, we have a Father that would come after us, and he doesn't just leave us, we do have our free will to go do, love, we either love him or we don't, and he's not going to force us to love him, but he wants us to love him, and he wants us, he doesn't want us just to go out into the world, he, I mean, he, he'll let us, because he wants you to taste it. And he wants you to understand that there's nothing there for you. And there's nothing good in it. Yeah, yeah. And it says that he is not willing that any should perish. Yeah. He doesn't want any of us to just stay in there and die in the world. We may be saved, but if we die in the world, what, what heavenly treasures would we have? Yeah. I mean, I, I spoke on this. I don't remember when it was. But we should strive for the, for the heavenly treasures than the earthly treasures. Yeah. If we spend our entire life in the, in the world and we're, we're, you know, we want to be cool in high school... Every guy wants to be cool. Every girl wants to be cool. What what are what heavenly treasures are we going to gain from that? Dear Lord. Okay. So and then it says that whenever he finds that one that had gone astray, he he's more happy about that one that came back, and he's more happy about finding that one than he would the ninety nine because the ninety nine was still with him. They were yeah. still following him, but that one that gone astray, he still loved that one that gone astray. He still loves you, even though you want to go in the world. He still loves you, yes, and he's more. He would be more excited. Aren't you glad that he he wouldn't scold you, he wouldn't whip you, he wouldn't give you a whipping like your dad would whenever you've done something wrong. He loves you, and he he's gonna he's gonna be like this whenever you're coming yes, out. Man. Yes, whenever, he, whenever he's run, whenever you're running towards him, he's gonna have open arms, and he's yes. he's gonna love you, and he's gonna. Hold you just like you had never left. Amen. And that's all I have. Amen. Good for you. 
I've already been in this one time before, and uh, I did this Wednesday night, but I got a little bit more text on it, too. We're in Acts 26, 14. Say amen when you're there. All right. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus who, whom thou persecutest. So normally, you know, we think of this, we think of Saul persecuting Christians, but I want to take it to a deeper level. This is not only for Saul, this is for the saved sinner. Anytime that we are willfully in sin, we are persecuting Jesus. And I like to take this, I like to take this verse deeper and read it, why persecutest thou me? Jesus is asking, why Saul? Why, Evan? Why persecute me? You know, what did I do to you? What did Jesus do to us? No, what did he do for us, you know? And um, uh, then we, we go on down, and it says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. We are persecuting Jesus any time that we are living in sin. Our Savior, our Lord and Savior, we are persecuting him when we are willfully choosing to sin over living for Jesus. And um, praise God for grace, though. Amen. And... Um, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And, and that, that um, we'll see in my notes here. Uh, oh, I took that and I said, why kick against the pricks? Why are you choosing to live in the world instead of go all out for God? You know, why are you choosing to put it off? You know, why are you choosing to kick against the pricks? And I've got some more text for this, too. I got this last night from First John. Um, we're starting in verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Yeah. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, that just goes to back up my statement, you know, uh, if, um, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. We persecute Jesus. And uh, that's all I had so far. But. We'll be in Daniel 1. <laughs> yeah. We'll start in verse number three. And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of the eunuchs, and uh, that he should bring a certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as that had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learnings and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. And then what happens in here in verse 6 and 7, uh, the, the king has given all these men names. Uh, uh, he's given them Mish uh, Mishael, the name of Shadrach, and then, uh, or sorry, Mishael, uh, Meshach, and uh, Daniel, uh, Belteshazzar. I'm not really going to worry about those words. But what the main verse that I want to focus on is verse number 8. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile, defile himself. And today, In today's day and hour, we need a bunch of young people that... Uh, don't defile themselves with the king's meat. You say, what is the king's meat? It's the world, yeah. and it's the things that they have to offer, and it, it's it's sin. Young people, the, the devil would want nothing more than to tear your parents down and direct their testimony. And parents, the devil would want nothing more than to wreck your children's life and their testimony. And every time that we're not protecting our children and we're not protecting our own heart, we're giving the devil a foot in the door with the king's meat. At all times, this, this king, he's, he's offering these, these Hebrew children, that he's offering them the king's meat. He's offering these things that he, think is, he thinks is good. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. We need a bunch of people in this day and hour that's not gonna purpose, that, that is going to purpose in their heart that they're not going to take the king's meat. The devil would want nothing more than to wreck our testimony. We need a bunch of parents 
uh, in this day and hour to say that as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And we, you know, I, I'm thankful for a mom and dad that would raise me and my brother up around the things of God. We were in the church every Sunday, every time the doors were open. And Daniel purposed in his heart. He, he knew what was right. What, what, they, what, what instead he ate, it, it was pulse, it was vegetables, grain, stuff like that over what the king was offering. I'm sure what the king was offering, it was probably like Texas Roadhouse or, or you know, the steak or some Welch's grape juice. Can I get an amen? Uh, th this is what he was offered. And to be honest with you, if I was offered those things, I, I would probably give in to it. If I was in that situation, I'm not, I'm not better than that and I'm not higher than that to think that I wouldn't give in. But Daniel and these Hebrew children... Uh, they purposed in their heart that they're not going to defile themselves with it. So in today's day and hour, we have the, the, the world uh, fighting us, and we have sin, and we have all these things that the, dev the devil in this world is offering us, just like this king is offering these, the, these Hebrew boys. And it's up to us in our own heart. You know, I said for the parents, you know, well, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But as for me, it's a personal thing. As for me, my body, my soul, my mind... We're going to serve the Lord. We need to take that stand in our own life and say, yes, the king is offering these things. The world's offering sin. The, the world's offering all this thing, all the fun. And it looks good. This, 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 this steak that he's given and this, this meat and this uh, Welch's grape juice, it, it looks good. And, and, and if we're being honest this morning, the things of this world, it looks good. It, it's fun for a season. But that, that, that's the catch. It's a season. But anyway, to wrap it all up, don't pur uh, purpose in your heart not to eat the king's meat. Um, Luke. <laughs> Psalms chapter 139. Uh, this morning, I, I feel like I've missed the will of God. They've all preached on sin and living right. Uh, when's, my when's my time start? It starts now? Well, dear Lord. Well, for the next four minutes, with the Lord's help, I'd like to preach on... What is on God's mind? What is on God's mind? Uh, Psalms chapter 139, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. As we read these texts, this text really preaches itself. Just going to add some commentary, but the Lord knows every single thing about you. The Lord knows the worst about you, but yet he's the one that loves you the most. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. God understands your thoughts even before you think them. I'm talking the most vile thoughts. Yet God loves you the most. He was still willing to send Jesus Christ to die on Calvary's tree for you. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all of my ways. He knows you. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. I love what David says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Let's jump down a few verses, and uh, let's read verse number 17. So a, a while ago, Gavin asked me a question. He said, do you think there's more water droplets on this planet or particles of sand? My answer is particles of sand. I still don't know if that's true, but I do know one thing, that God's thoughts towards you are more than the particles of sand on the, on the earth. So let's read verse number uh, 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. This is what's on God's mind this morning. You're on God's mind this morning. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. What blows my mind this morning is that the God who created everything, the God who has everything, is thinking about me. He's thinking about you. And what I love about God is he can be a one-track mind except still be a multitasker. He can have all of these thoughts about my wife that far exceed the sand on this earth. And the thoughts he has toward me does not collide with, him, with hers. God can think about you as if you're the only person on this planet. That blows my mind. When I close my eyes at night, God is thinking about me. When I'm dreaming about my beautiful wife, God is thinking about me. When I wake up in the morning, God is thinking about me. And Jeremiah 29, 11 says his thoughts towards us are peace and not evil. God is thinking about you. I think about 
Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, you were on his mind. I think about as Jesus stood before Pilate and was scourged, you was on his mind. I think about how Jesus hung out on Calvary's tree, you were on his mind. God is ever thinking about us, and I can't grasp that God would think about a bunch of low-down sinners all the time. He loves you. You're on his mind this morning. I think I'm out of time. Brother Levi, would you come up here and preach? But that's what's on God's mind this morning. Amen. You are. First Samuel chapter number four, and this is Luke thought he was throwing a curveball, but this might be more than that. Than that is. But um, this is what God laid on my heart, and I'm sure that it is. First Samuel chapter four, and we're going to go ahead and start reading because we ain't got much time. Um, but starting in verse number two, there we're going to read two through four, and then jump over to ten. It says, and the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they were joined battle. Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew the army of, in the field, about 4,000 men. And when the people of, uh, were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh, that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant, um, of the Lord of the hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were with the ark of the covenant of God. Jumping over there to verse um, number 10, it says, And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter for their fell of Israel, 30,000 footmen. So um, with the help of the Lord, I'm going to preach on just for only about two more minutes, turning godly things into idols. So we see here um, that in verse 2, the Israelites, they had a small setback. It says there were 4,000 men that were slain, but we have to realize that just because there's a small setback doesn't mean that we have to compromise on what we know is right. And we see here the Israelites, it was more convenient for them to go and get the ark than it was for them to get down on their knees, to get down on their face and beg out that God would help them. And, you know, we also see that compromise is anything that takes us or takes God out and replaces him with something else. That is compromise. And doing what is convenient, it leads to compromise. And that's what happened um, to the children of Israel here. They went from 4,000 men dying to later on 30,000 men dying. So it ended up that there was 34,000 men that died. And I truly believe if after verse 2, if they would have you know, went after God instead of relying on the ark for their power, then God would have helped them through that. And really where my heart is this morning is, you know, everything that God has blessed us with, with the mountain, with the tent revivals, the youth meeting, everything that God has given us, if we're not really careful, then we'll rely more on those things and getting the power from those things than we will from God. And especially with the tent revival coming up, it would be very easy to look back and see how God has blessed it before and just expect for God to do it again. But um, one thing we have to realize is that there was a reason why God blessed us during that time. There was a reason why God has come through every time because we have put him first in everything that is done up there and you know we must always be careful to remember where the blessing is coming from yes. and you know that can be very hard sometimes whenever God's blessing you you get your eyes so focused on the blessing that you forget about the blesser and I think you know it would help us a lot especially leading into the tent revival just looking back on those things and remembering you know that it was God that did every single bit of it yes, and you know just because God has blessed us before he doesn't have to do it again if we don't you know, put him first, then it's all going to be in vain. And, you know, the children of Israel here, that's really what happened. They forgot where the power was coming from. And, you know, whenever we forget where the power is coming from, that is when um, the power leaves us. Amen. And, you know, there I'll end with this. In verse um, 19 through 22, it's talking about um, the, him, Eli's daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, it says, um, and a child came to her there in 21 and 22, and she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel um, because the ark of God was taken because of her father. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. And, you know, really my heart this morning is that that would be something that is never said about this church, that the glory is departed. And, you know, really um, what we have to realize is, yeah, I'm just going to fix one more thought is, um, just keeping God in the center, keeping God first, and you know everything will be just fine. Yeah, really. I can it's an hour-long sermon into four minutes. Uh, we'll be in Psalms chapter number four this morning, and it's only ten thirty-three. I almost have time for five minutes this morning. 
Uh, we'll be reading uh, verse number seven. Uh, thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the uh, time that their corn and their wine was increased. This morning, I just want to talk about the gladness that comes from the Lord, the joy that comes from the Lord. That you know, there's nothing in the world that can match this joy. As uh, it says in this chapter, Psalms chapter four, that uh, the gladness in my heart more than the time that their corn and their wine had increased. And this was something big for them. They're saying we got double the yield this year. We had double the portion from the vineyards, double the portion from the uh, corn. And, you know, the joys that come from the Lord is greater than this, that there's nothing in the world that can match the joys of the Lord. There's nothing in the world that can match what God's going to do for us. In my life, just in this short 20 years, I can see times in my life where there's been things that the world offers, things that the world brings joy through, and nothing compares to the joy of God, nothing that can fulfill the joy that can only come from the Lord. That in Nehemiah chapter number uh, 8, verse number 10, uh, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. That the Lord, He gives us this joy, unspeakable joy. Un, uh, this joy is just something that comes only from the Lord. And this thing, we had talked about the sins that come with life. We've talked about just different things this morning. But I just, God had so laid this on my heart. Hopefully, when all y'all was asleep this morning, about three o'clock, God laid this on my heart. Just you know, have gladness in the things you're doing because. We've been at uh, Trinity all week this week, and it's easy to catch yourself, you know, saying, you know, I have to go. I have to be out this time. But, you know, it's a privilege to get to do these things. It's a privilege to get to go to these meetings. It's just a privilege to get to do the things that God allows us to do, that there's gladness that comes with this because there's not many other circumstances in life where you find joy in being gone all day, that just doing these things, you know, just laboring as hard as you can. But there's joy that comes with serving the Lord. There's joy that comes with the things of doing God's work. There's joy that comes with uh, serving God. And it's something like, uh, it's uncomparable to the things that, you know, you find joy in in the world. There's so many things you can find joy in. I could go down a list of things that, you know, people find pleasures of the world, pleasures that, you know, men find we're in a pleasure-filled society that everything that we do, everything that we see is based around pleasure, based around you know, what can we get from it? What can I gain from this? But, you know, when you're serving the Lord, it's, you know, what can I do for God? What can I do to further the kingdom of God? What can I do to uh, or strengthen my walk with God? And this is just something that, you know, really spoke to me last night as I was reading um, that, you know, God has put gladness in my heart. God gives us these things. God puts that in our heart. God puts something in our heart that we can't find on our own. We can't find that joy that God gives us. We can't find joy in these bad times. There's No matter what circumstances you're going through in life, God can give us joy in those times. God can give us joy when it's un... Uh, when you can't even explain where the joy comes from. You know, there's so many people I can think of. I think of uh, the Benfield family losing their child. You know, God can give them joy in this time. And that thing don't... or that stuff don't come with the world. The world can't give you joy in times of sorrow. The world can't give you joy in times of uh, grief. But the Lord can give you joy any time and anything he wants to give you joy in. And I just want to thank the Lord today for, you know, allowing me to serve him and allowing me to do these things. And I'm thankful that, you know, God gives me this peace and this joy while I'm getting to serve him. And that's all I have this morning. Are you free? So I'm just going to lay that right there because I might throw it at somebody. <laughs> on accident. Not on purpose. <laughs> If you have your Bibles and we'll turn with me to Luke chapter number 15. Luke chapter number 15. After being at Trinity, the Lord has laid a thought on my mind and I want to title my message, What Are You Crossing the Fence For? What Are You Crossing the Fence For? The Bible says, we're going to start in verse number 14, and it says, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And what does the Bible say? And he began to be in want. Yes, then we'll skip over to verse 22 for the sake of time. It says, But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Let us pray at this time. Dear Lord, most gracious heavenly father, we thank you for your scripture. We thank you for the reading of your word. Touch us, help us, guide us in the direction we need to go. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. So I want to preach on the thought, what are you crossing the fence for? You say, preacher, what are you getting at? Uh, 
the other day, Rebel was over at the house, and him and Letty was playing out on the swing set in the yard, and there was two swings hanging side by side, both of them hanging there in perfect working condition. They could have used either one. Rebel's swinging on one, and Letty walks up to me, and she says, Daddy, Rebel won't let me swing on that swing. swings hanging side by side. I said, why can't you swing on the one that's right beside me? She said, because daddy, I want to swing on that swing. And can I tell you something, church, as I begin to think about this, boy, ain't that just like us as Christians. Yes. We're always standing inside the fence where God has put us, where God has saved, where God has fed, where God is just trying to protect us. And we're under across the fence thinking, oh my,
true, but you say, preacher, what are you getting at? God loves us so much. He loves the son so much. I don't care how far you are in the far country. Yeah. He loves you so much. He'll bring you. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. He'll do it. Amen. Lastly, as Brother C.T. Townsend said, Put some shoes on his feet. You say, preacher, what do you do? Can I tell you what shoes does? It gets you up off the word that old nasty stuff you all walk around. Hey, yes, sir, that's good. That's good. Yes. You say, preacher, what do shoes do? Can I tell you it separates you from the nasty ground, from where everybody's a spitting and everybody's a walking. I'm thankful for what the Father gave me. Can I tell you something? 